I have a question for any of the panelists. So I think an emerging area of interesting research is showing that there are higher rates of individuals with gender dysphoria that also present on the autism spectrum. So I was just wondering if any of the panelists had either research or clinical experience with those coexisting populations and if they could speak to that. I'm not normally that sort of research geek that pulls out the numbers like this, I, I, but I, I think I can. Okay. Um, it, the, uh, it's, it's, you're right, there, there's, it's an emerging trend in that it's now becoming known. Yes. Clearly it's, it's, it's not a trend that it's been going on for a long time. Right. right? And uh, so the DSM, the infamous uh, diagnostic manual that tells us the likelihood that things are going to happen, would suggest that a lot of gender transitions or trend gender identifying differently is you know, ranked at 0.001% for males or females. It's quite low. And then if you move that to the autism spectrum recently, they're finding it's close as 4 or 5%. So significantly more likely. Um, the, the research right now, as far as I know, is quite sparse in terms of uh, understanding that. They have gone into some gender identity clinics and started to, to do things like the ADOS and ADI and measure the likelihood that someone has autism in those clinics and that they weren't previously identified, and they're finding that rates are close to 20%, so it's much higher. So there's certainly an identification, but at this point, the, the sort of the, my understanding of the reasons behind it, it's, it's speculative at this point. Do you guys? Okay. Yeah, and I would, I would add, so, so from clinical experience, that um, there's also the situation uh, that a person with ASD might uh, identify themselves with that community, but maybe not necessarily um, have gender dysphoria. So, there, so it's a very, uh, we, we need lots of research before we can make any kind of conclusion. Okay, thank you. I just had a question about the, the rate and risk of suicide in autism. Um, I can see risk and protective factors playing a role, and I'm just curious about whether research has been done on that. There is research going on in the area of suicide, suicide ideation and risk um, in autism. There's been a number of studies that have come out in the last few years identifying higher uh, rates of both uh, suicide ideation and suicide attempts. Um, research that we've done here in Canada, there's a work going, out, uh, going on right now by Brian Mashara and his colleagues at the uh, CRIS uh, Centre, in, it's in French, in the uh, Université de Québec and Montréal. Um, looking at kind of case reviews in, in hospitalized settings, uh, trying to understand the pathways of, of um, uh, towards suicide ideation and suicide attempts in clinical situations for people with ASD. Um, uh, and, and there certainly is an association between that in many ways what you'd expect in the general population of associations with trauma, with, with depression and kind of uh, and crisis. Um, so there's still a lot of work to go on before we really figure out what are the actual rates versus the fact that they're likely higher than in the general population. So um, I was actually curious, because um, I think this has been uh, hinted at and talked around some before, uh, but I'm wondering about how much work has been done looking at um, how much there might be more uh, somatic and physiological type mental health things that um, uh, might not be um, so apparent in terms of the psychological states in people with ASD because it you know, would seem to be something that uh, uh, you would find given that this is a community where often people might have more difficulty um, articulating um, what's going on in their heads, as it were. So, Patrick, did you mean um so physiological arousal in, um, in well I'm, I'm kind of thinking because I know that cross-culturally there's some work that finds that uh, mental health symptoms in um, uh, non-western cultures often manifest in a more somatic way for instance you might have um, people who are lethargic for example instead of having a depressed mood so sort of a subtle difference there and, and I'm wondering uh, have people really been, been looking at um, whether uh, the definition of mental health uh, in ASD might have to be adjusted in, in how we're assessing it? Um, is, is that going to be different in people with ASD than the general population sometimes? Mm, yeah, that's, that's a really good one. Did you... <laughs> 
<laughs> it, it, it's a, it's an, it's an excellent point, and, and one of the things when we when we talk about trying to understand, uh, is there a an, a mental health problem here? Because um, we don't want to um, over pathologize, uh, you know, difference um, uh, as something that's necessarily psychiatric in nature. Uh, so one common line of thinking uh, around this is to first truly try to understand what a person's what we call baseline is for themselves whether it's around anxiety or compulsions or, sense or social difficulties or even sensory issues. But to understand what is typical for that person, um, uh, they may still have difficulties at the time, uh, ASD related kind of some difficulties, but what's that baseline like? And then are there acute kind of um, shifts from there that are noticeable for the person or for others that know that person really well or some combination thereof that are causing them distress or, or difficulty. So it's a slight, as you mentioned, twist or shift that um, tries to recognize that you need to understand the, the person first for who they are and what's, what's <coughs> typical for them before going to that next step. Uh, the, the only other thing I would add to that is there's also, um, I think, the, the example of uh, people who are able to keep it together for, for very long times and able to cope and uh, have lots of really good coping strategies over the years. But then when difficult moments or, um, you know, what was that balance that you had up? What, what was happening? There was some... Uh, demands, demands and resources and meaning. Demands, resources are just overloading them then at that point, you know, their coping mechanisms start to break down and you might start to see uh, uh, an escalation of those symptoms, you know, like much more anxiety or, or depression and so on. So, yeah, looking at that change over time is really important. Okay, over here, please. Thank you. So my question is for um, Alex and Kenneth. Thank you so much for sharing uh, your personal stories with us. I found them very, very helpful. Um, and my question it comes from the perspective as both a physician and um, a parent. I have a son uh, with autism spectrum disorder. Um, so I just wanted if you could come up with something, uh, just thinking from my perspective as a parent, um, was there something, one or two things that you can think of that your family or your parents did that were <laughs> The, the most or one or two standout things that you found in your journey um, through young adulthood. My, my son is now 14. So just as a parent, is there something that you might advise me or the rest of the audience, because so, there are some parents here that you would find? I know I'm putting you on the spot, but if there is something that would be very helpful. Well, my parents... Uh, my parents have always been very interested in a type of um, psychology called family systems therapy, which basically views humans as um, responding to stress within their environment and constantly assessing threats. So your flight or f your fight or flight response is always activated. That system is seen a lot in animals, so that's applied to humans. So they always looked at trying to minimize my stress levels. My dad's really into that, just trying to keep me relaxed and also keep themselves relaxed, and then the symptoms seemed to go away. I also had a very, I had a mild to medium case, so I was able to really do that. I've been able to really shift fairly far along the spectrum to being very high functioning. I always was quite high functioning. So I think just really trying to keep the kid relaxed really helps, um, while at the same time ensuring that they still get out and do things and still really function up without not doing anything. They can't let their diagnosis be a crutch in any way and regress. They still have to keep advancing while being relaxed. They're, one of my friends um, does, their families looked at something called recovery, which is a lot of different phrases to cope with anxiety. Her whole family suffers from anxiety. Um, it's called the recovery program. I'm not sure the name of the person that started it, but it's got phrases like, oh, something's not dangerous. 
So again, that's a cognitive behavior-based therapy, mm -hmm. but little phrases like that make a big difference. And also if the kid is really interested in something and then shows you, I had an instructor once whose kid had autism and the kid would be playing video games and he'd be like, mommy, mommy, look at what I'm doing. Um, the kid engage with the kid and their interests, that can also be a big help because it will kind of draw them out. I know it's very hard for primary care physicians. You expected to be these amazing specialists in everything because you just don't know what's going to come to you. Mm -hmm. So that's the tips I've got. Great. Well, thank you very much, Alex. I would just uh, say my own family situation was uh, I would say unique, but it, it, I think it allowed me to survive to the stage of post-secondary intact and very functional. But in terms of uh, extended family, my nieces and nephews benefit from function. So uh, giving them a responsibility like a paper route, it's independent and it's social at the same time to some extent. That I've seen the effect that's had on my nephew, and uh, just uh, uh, engaging in something that they really like and they're really good at, so they can do that independently or as part of a group. And also, uh, so my niece runs, she likes to run, she can do that by herself or with a group, and then. So teams of sports like soccer or, or grass field hockey are, are the next step, but that's what I've seen work for my nieces and nephews. So. Thank you so much. Very awesome. We, ju we just have a follow-up question here online um, about whether either of you, in terms of experiencing autism, um, have one thing that you'd like um, families or peers to understand when you were younger? What, one thing that you would have liked your families or peers to under, better understand about you? If you're talking about immediate family, well, I don't think anybody has any idea how disruptive it was moving from A to B or um, traveling and not having a map and knowing where we were. <laughs> so, I mean, just these things I'm sure were totally unknown, but they were significant. <laughs> so, um, that's just one example. So. Um, just because um, they just weren't aware of. Um, Asperger's syndrome in the early nine, late 80s, early 90s, the way they are now. Um, I did experience a lot of bullying at school. It wasn't severe bullying, it was just social exclusion and teasing all the time. The school that I went to also, they had a lot of administrative problems, so they weren't good, great at interfering with kids that were just constant bullies. But really just advocating at the school saying, look, this behavior is not appropriate. The kids need to stop. Um, I don't care if they have problems. That does not give them an excuse to pick on someone else. Those kids that have problems are just going to have to deal with it. Thank you. Now over here, um, I don't. OK. Uh, yes, I have a question for. Well, Dr. Worlingway could also apply to other, other, um, other psychologists or professionals. Uh, on the question of what it means to be an expert in autism, uh, you mentioned about being a generalist and being able to deal with many things. I, I've been seeing some, some articles online about how Autistic adults are the experts, um, the real experts, but then, yeah, what, what you clinicians think in terms of what is required to be 
an expert um, as I try to convince researchers and clinicians that autistic adults need to get more in, involved and uh, yeah, sort of steer things that way for autism treatment and research. But but yeah, uh, it's it's um, an interesting question on what it means to be an expert. I'm going to start. I'm going to start Jonathan off on that. Dr. Weiss. Weiss can start that one. Just get close to that mic. So, um, so I think there's a an uh, important voice that's arisen over a number of years now. Um, exactly that you just echoed about the importance of of who is the expert and and asking clinicians or scientists to get um, out of the, uh, you know, get off a high horse, the expression, a high horse, meaning to, to really uh, understand that there's a collaboration that's meant to go on here, a partnership, rather than one person being an expert and the other person not having expertise or knowledge, or um, far from it, right? So that kind of dichotomy, I think, is, um, was identified as problematic for a long time and, and it continues to be problematic. I think many clinicians, and I'll, I'll step back and let other people also uh, jump in, but I think the most fruitful relationships, whether it's between um, a scientist or a researcher, right, and the people involved in studies and the people is, is one where it's collaborative. I know in the work that, that I do, we're driven primarily by stakeholder advisory groups for all of the projects that we aim to undertake. And what I mean by that is, uh, Exactly that. We might be, I might have a lot of knowledge about statistics of studies that I've read and studies I've undertaken, but I'm not deciding on the, the, the projects that I do just because I think that they're interesting. Sure, it's part of it is my interest, but it's really being directed by the people I'm hoping to work with, understand, and help. So adults on the spectrum, family members, and so on. So I see it as a partnership. But rather than one person being an expert and the other one not having expertise or, or knowledge. And I feel like certainly clinically, um, it's collaborative as well. But I, I think I'll let other people jump in um, too. I, I think it's a great question. And uh, I would echo a lot of what uh, Jonathan had said earlier. It, there, as, as I said, sort of somewhat facetiously, there, there is no, I don't think there's a sticker one gets to be a specialist in autism. There, 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 the amount of training uh, available for clinicians, psychiatry, psychology, it's slim, for sure. It is changing. So, uh, you know, in my own personal experience, that expertise has just been by putting in the time, right? And, and more importantly, it's listening to stories. Right? So when I will often have people come in and say, oh, I understand you do CBT, what book do you follow? Uh, I will often say, well, I don't have a book because it really depends on the individual that sits in front of you, right? So we've heard from two very different perspectives on what worked for them and what experiences were best for them, and I'm sure it would be the same for other people that are affected. So it's, it's really a matter of time. That's not very satisfying in terms of an actual description, but really it's, it's just listening to those stories and then how you can then modify them accordingly. So my name is Sinober. I'm a social worker and I work um, with Squamish Nation Children and Families. And one of the things that I have been thinking about throughout the day is the limited um, conversation or um, knowledge about First Nations communities, uh, children and adults uh, living with ASD and um, the impact that intergenerational trauma um, and trauma um, impacts them as children and adulthood. Um, I have to add to that and say that we have a really um, well-oriented and caring uh, pre- and postnatal program, and that we found that through that program that early diagnosis um, and diagnosis has informed um, a lot of our practice with teenagers. Um, but the difficulty and challenges um, associated with that is how many children go undetected, um, and you've mentioned that already, um, and how that impacts them, especially children that are in care um, that transition into adulthood and adult services. 
Um, so I was just wondering if you had any thoughts to share or if you guys had any knowledge of um, research or partnerships um, with First Nations communities <coughs> or agencies that were also dealing with similar issues. Well, this is something that Dr. Irochi and I have been talking about for a couple of years now, so I'm going to turn this one over to her. Um, well, we're just applying for a grant, <laughs> so we hope to get some money, it's really just pilot money, um, to, try, to try to organize an autism awareness event of some kind in an Aboriginal uh, community. So uh, maybe we can exchange some information. Um, because this is really, I, I think, critical, and Deborah has realized because you uh, provide resources and information to the community, um, and I've, I, I used to in my graduate days do work in Aboriginal communities, and it's always been in the back of my mind. Um, we've got to get some autism awareness out um, and see, you know, what's happening for families in these communities. We don't even know. We have no clue, uh, really, what's happening. Um, the other thing is um, the uh, Ministry of Children and Family Development Initiative, the parent coaching uh, program that uh, Pat Miranda from UBC and uh, Tony Bailey are co-leading. Um, they There is a component of that parent coaching program that is specifically um, oriented toward Aboriginal communities. So you, you may also want to connect with them. And that's very early. That's prior to diagnosis. So that's very early intervention. Okay, next question. Um, my name's Joanna Harrison, and I have a son who's uh, 19 years old. And my question is for Tony, or for, um, uh, for Tony, no, sorry, Kenneth, Kenneth and, um, Specifically, Kenneth, I guess, because um, one comment that you had made was that you said that you have always been an observer. And it kind of struck me, because that's pretty much my son's personality. And I'm wondering if that is something that you've always wanted to change about yourself, or have you been comfortable with, it, with that trait, or do you? Uh, I wouldn't say I'm uncomfortable with it anymore, but it's some, it's not always a positive because it's like uh, uh, being in the uh, environmental chamber. You're 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 not really part of um, feeling part of of a community, for instance. I mean, it, there are there have been times when I I felt you you just feel comfortable is the way to put it, and you're. Uh, but other times you feel outside of uh, the community or the situation, so. Have you ever wanted to change that about yourself? Have you ever, you know, sort oh, of? Oh yes, but I don't think I found a way to do it consciously. <laughs> it's okay. just, if it's occurred, yeah. it was not directly, <laughs> so. And what about Alex? Is, is there been something that you have wanting to do something different or something that you could have changed and you didn't in your life? There was something that you wish you'd had a, a different, taken a different path maybe with something? Um, no, not really. Um, I mean, again, I've always just thought of it as learning to speak a different language mm. and I mean I'm quite lucky girls it's already been very well documented in girls that girls do already have a social fluency like if you kind of think of a scale of sociability there's neurotypical women are up here and then there's going to be girls with ASD right down here then there's neurotypical men here <laughs> Everybody settle down. Yeah, right here. So girls, girls are already, um, girls are already have a sort of innate social fluency for whatever reason. I don't know why that is. 
Um, so I've always just, you know, I am quite intelligent, so I've always been able to use my intelligence to really acquire a social fluency that's just accumulated with different tips over time. Um, my first job was working in a cafe and I was really forced to socialize. And because I'm high functioning enough, it's again, you can be drop Dr. Ayurochi touch. Grace. Grace touched on this, um, where you develop a resiliency from systematic exposure to something without regressing. So that's how I've learned to socialize, um, and that's worked for me. Um, maybe, maybe comedy might be the next direction no. for you. <laughs> Structurally, comedy its quite a difficult profession. And um, <laughs> one thing I found that could be quite interesting is the military does a lot of resilience training for um, soldiers because combat's a very stressful um, environment that's been applied to um, doctors working in a hospital setting, especially residents, because that's also a very stressful environment. I've always felt learning some of that would be really helpful. Like I've always found the movies, the Bourne series and The Accountant, because they're all about functioning in a setting, um, very useful to watch just for fun. When you have an adolescent or young adult with uh, ASD and mental health issues like anxiety and depression, they aren't always uh, amenable to, to accompanying you to treatment of any sort. Do you have any suggestions in terms of, of uh, anything to assist in that situation? I believe the clinical term is bribery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I meant incentive. Sorry. It, it, it's a good point, and uh, often we're asking these adolescents to go into a room to talk to a complete stranger about the things they really don't want to talk about. So it, it's, uh, it, it is an uphill battle. Um, the, the, of course, the challenge for the clinician then is to engage that individual in a way that makes sense to them, and that comes back to the point that was raised earlier in that individualized treatment. So my personal rule of thumb is you can't fire me until at least the second meeting. Right? and then gives us a chance to figure out what that agenda might look like between the first and the second, and then if we can work to some mutually agreeable solution, great, we can proceed. But it, I, I have I had a number of parents who have thrown in an extra dinner, uh, maybe access to a video game, sleepover, uh, so and sometimes incentive works. Do you have other techniques? Yeah, no, I, I agree. Sometimes uh, it might not be called ethical <laughs> by our standards, but, you know, we've made deals with parents and... Um, you know, parents will, will sort of make a, a deal or a contract with their child and say, okay, if you go for at least one or two sessions, um, see what it's like, then we can talk about it. Or, you know, you don't have to go after that if you don't really like the person. Kind of just getting in the door sometimes is, you know, if, if the clinician is skilled, um, can, you know, the clinician can develop somewhat of a rapport that will not scare them. I think, I think what I've seen is that they're just scared that who is this person? What are they gonna do to me? What's gonna happen, right? When, when you just start talking more sort of just, you know, uh, a nice kind of um, talk that makes sense to them, like what are you interested in? Rather than, you know, they're expecting all these clinical questions from us. Um, I think sometimes that just makes them feel a bit more comfortable. But the key is, you got to find the right person, right? So maybe you as a parent interviewing the clinician first, you know, kind of meeting the clinician and getting to know, like, is this going to be a good fit with my child? Because you don't want to go through all that and then be disappointed, right? And have a really bad negative first impression, which then you've lost all this effort, right? 